Proverbs, so far, here's what we've done. We have talked about chapter 16, everything with a place and a purpose. A God-planned life is the best life. It pays to take life seriously. And tonight, gray hairs can teach you a lot about life. Let me repeat that. Gray hairs can teach you a lot about life. How many believe that? It can. And so those of you who have gray hairs, you're smiling, and I'm glad you are. So let me say this tonight before we begin from, uh, about this study tonight. For all of you who are serious, you will add something to your diet for the rest of your lives tonight. For the rest of your lives, I guarantee you, you'll want to add this to your diet. We'll get there. Tonight is going to be an interesting study as we wrap up Revelation, or excuse me, uh, wrap up Proverbs 16. So the topic tonight is gray hairs can teach you a lot about life. I, may, may I, I might add to that, so can thinning hair. <laughs> and so can no hair. I have five grandchildren, another one's coming in June. And uh, one of my granddaughters was over the house the other day, and she was, she's three years old, and she's very talkative and very expressive. And Mary Lane, which is Wilder's sister, uh, was playing with my hair. She was sitting on my lap. I told her a story, and she was playing with my hair. And she was real quiet, and she looked at me with those big blue eyes, and she said, Papa, you have baby hair. <laughs> I guess that means my hair is thinning. I don't know. But obviously, when you have gray hair, Solomon says that uh, you've learned something. You've learned something in life. Now, Solomon is going to concentrate the first part of this section on our words, and so will I. We've been there before, but not as deep. So here's what he says in the first part of this section. He says, this is from the message, A wise person gets known for insight, gracious words, and to, one, and to one's reputation. True intelligence is a spring of fresh water, while fools sweat it out the hard way. They make a lot of sense, these wise fools, whenever they speak, their reputation increases. Gracious speech is like clover honey or honeycomb. Good taste to the soul, quick energy for the body. There's a way that looks harmless enough. Look again, it leads straight to hell. Appetite is an incentive to work. Hunger makes you work all the harder. Mean people spread mean gossip. Their words smart and burn. So I want to just take you to another spot of that and give it to you in the uh, Good News Translation. A wise, mature person is known for his understanding. The more pleasant his words, the more persuasive he is. Wisdom is a fountain of life to the wise, but trying to educate stupid people is a waste of time. <laughs> Intelligent people think before they speak. What they say is then more persuasive. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the taste and good for your health. What you think is the right road may lead to death. A laborer's appetite makes him work harder because he wants to satisfy his hunger. Evil people look for ways to harm others. Even their words burn with evil. So they're all categorized around words. These seven verses are centered around one specific statement which we'll study in detail tonight. But first, let's talk about words. Proverbs 18.21 says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Uh, he tells us that, and I'll give you another translation, it says this, words kill, words give life. They either poison, they're either poison or fruit you choose. So death and life is in the power of the tongue. We can kill somebody with our tongues. We can elevate someone, we can lift them up. You can actually harm yourself with your tongue. If you are always negative and that's all you speak to yourself is negative things, you're harming yourself. Uh, you'll start to believe those things and you'll actually get into a depression. If you're a positive, then you're going to aid something in your life. So it's really important. Now I understand bad things happen to good people and I understand there's times we have to deal with negative things. But there are some people that all they are are negative. How many of you have been around people like that? You want to get away from people like that, I'm going to tell you that right away. You're not going to help them. They're going to pull you down. And, they're, and it's, it's devastating. You need to be positive. When I'm around negative people and they're constantly negative, I always inject something positive. They usually scoff it off, but I always inject something positive. Positive people are people you want to be around. They'll build you up. They'll tell you things. You know, it's, it's the old saying whether people see the glass half full or half empty. And so it's very important for us and our attitude for our actual health, for our life. Your, your attitude is extremely important. Uh, if you're always negative about yourself, then you're going to have a, you're going to have a negative attitude. And you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna wear that and something's going to happen to your health. Uh, that's all over scripture. Even medical profession tells us that. So words are life. Uh, this proverb is saying that kind, gentle, and gracious words are a dessert for any occasion. So we know that words are life. We know that. They bring life. You can bring life to someone. Imagine someone had a terrible week and they see you walking down the hall coming to the study and you look at them and you say, man, I really like that, that blouse you have on, if you're a woman saying it to a man or to a woman. I really like that blouse you have on or I like that outfit you have on or you look great today. You know, that does something to people. It makes people feel great about themselves. It's, it's good to lift people up. It's good to be an encourager. The Bible tells us that we should encourage one another. And so it's, uh, it's extremely important for us to do that, not only for others, but for ourselves. Uh, they, the words go into our ears and our souls with 
sweet pleasure, he says. That's what he wants to happen. Uh, and then uh, they enliven the hearts and even our steps, is what Solomon is telling us. Our faces glow by their instant effect and sweet words and kind words. And energy and vitality are quickly restored to the cast down. We can create such words out of thin air by our lips. Then wisdom is gui when wisdom is guiding our speech, you will not know how many times I'll say something to someone, honestly, and they'll say, man, I needed to hear that today. How many of you ever I needed that today. You know, we all need that today. Don't think because someone's just a talker or someone's aggressive or someone is just kind of uh, A-type personality that they don't need that. Most of the times, they're the ones that need it more than anyone. Sure, I'll tell you that about me. I'll, she, I, I love those words of encouragement. They're just amazing to me. Now, I don't solicit them, but they're great when they come. Now, let me tell you one way, and I'm going to just deviate for a second, how premarital affairs start for women. I'm going to tell you exactly how it starts. It has nothing to do with sexuality at first. They have husbands who never build them up. When women, women are emotional, we all know that. Women need to be built up. They need to know that they're special. And when husbands don't do that and take it for granted, women will be sponges and they'll want that. They have husbands who will never build them up, who uh, talk to them aggressively, or who show more irritation and love in their speaking, and who boss them around and never do anything for them. You're bound to have a bad marriage if something like that happens, but there's something else that can happen. I've counseled a lot of people. These women who are craving attention then get near some fast-talking, smooth-speaking, complimentary wolf, I mean man, who's a player, and with sweet words and compliments, he starts to build those broken women up. And those bro broken women eat that stuff up like sponges. And she's a magnet for such attention. It doesn't start out sexual or sensual. Sometimes it can even start out spiritual. Listen, worst male wolves I've known uh, will talk spiritual all the while thinking sexual. And they will pray. They pray on people that, are, that are, have low self-esteem. They'll pray on women that are not getting any type of attention from their husbands, knowing full well what they're doing. They aren't just social nice guys. They have an agenda. And this is how I see many, many marriages getting, get messed up. So the question is, how do you talk to your spouse? And how do you listen? Well, let's talk about listening first. When a man can listen to a woman's feelings without getting angry and frustrated, he gives her a wonderful gift. He makes it safe for her to express herself. The more she's able to express herself, the more she feels heard and understood. And the more she's able to give a man the loving trust, acceptance, appreciation, admiration, approval, and encouragement that he needs. So it's a circle. Let me, I think I may have told you this, or maybe the other class, I'll tell it to you again. I remember years and years ago, we were very busy, we're still very busy, but I remember our, Cheryl's washing machine broke. She'll remember this, she's probably gonna smile. And um, I was, I had one day off, and that day off I usually tried to get everything done, but norm normally couldn't. And I remember towards the weekend she said to me, she said, Mark, my, my, my Washington machine is broke. She says, and I, I need to use it because we got a lot of clothes, you know, the kids and all. I said, okay, I'll, so I'll fix it on Monday. I said, all right. She said, I could probably wait until then. So uh, Monday came and I, I didn't fix it. So I said to her, well, um, all right, I'll fix it on Tuesday. She said, okay. She says, and she went on. She told me quite lengthy about how she needed the washing machine. You know, she was uh, very verbose. I mean, she could have wrote a little book. Mark, you understand, I didn't have these clothes. And I understand, she all did. Tuesday came and I fixed the washing machine. It was done. So she said to me, uh, she said, uh, I need that. Well, I said, I fixed it. She says, well, you don't understand. I needed that washing machine. I mean, I need it. I said, I fixed it. She said, well, you know, I needed it because the kids had these clothes. And I said, I fixed it. And she says, but I, you know, I need it. I need it. And I said, I took a chair out and I said, you just want to talk about this, don't you? That's women. They want to talk it through. They want to understand. Men, we want to fix it and get it over with. So we have to be good listeners because they may be telling you something that you know the answer to. They may be telling you something that you can finish the sentence with, but they want you to listen. How many are getting this? So that's about listening. But listen to what he says about talking. Um, you don't nudge each other. The question is, how do you, the question is, how do you, the question is, how do you talk to your spouse? Uh, is it like you talk to your friends or to other women or to other men? And leaving the marital issue, how do you talk to others around you? Your kids, your coworkers, your acquaintances, your friends, and others. What do, you, what do your words do? Do they promote health? I know that sounds weird. Do you heal others by encouragement, a wise counsel, gentle comfort? Or are your words like a piercing sword? Proverbs 12, 18 says sometimes they are. Do you leave others bleeding with caustic, critical, calloused, and, uh, and condemning words? And do you then put in salt? We're told only to season our speech with it, not to use it to hurt somebody. So what happens? Well, in Proverbs, it tells us that we need to do something about it. It says this. It says, 
A man has joy by the answer of his mouth. And a word spoken, spoken in good season, how good it is. So it's talking about our words. Our words can build people up. And, you know, there's a lot of times we hear things, we see things, and we want to instantly say something. A perfect example is uh, Shad and I were talking before we came in, so was I talking to Brian. I get lots of emails. We get a lot of things, that, a lot of comments that come by. And 98% of them are great comments. But I had some, I, we get some every now and then that just will send you through the roof. Like this one guy who commented this last week. And I, I don't read you all the good ones, but this one guy called me and he says, you're, you're something to the effect, your Proverbs study is excellent, you're, but you're still a twit. <laughs> twit. Wow. He said it not once, twice. So my instant thing is to shut him down verbally. That's my instant thing. My instant thing is to get back on him and tell him something like, well, you know, here's the deal. And this is going out, so maybe he's listening to it. It's okay. My instant thing was to tell him this. Here's the deal. Why are you listening? And if you are listening, did you miss a block in Christianity where it said not to name call people? I mean, did you miss that someplace? Then we get some people, and they'll probably hear this too. I didn't, uh, by the way, I didn't comment. Of course, I just did. But I didn't comment. Then we get this. We get, you know, you're in the news is amazing. Can you not find somebody down there to put it on right away? Because it goes on. I mean, Brian and Renee do an amazing job with doing the Facebook. And they have to take it to the... Brian and Renee, YouTube, excuse me, do a great job with YouTube, and they have to take it to the, to the uh, Apple Store, and it takes them a couple hours to download it. And so it goes on maybe two days later. So we have several people who are saying, why don't you just, it's irrelevant. This news that I'm giving you is not irrelevant. I promise if you watch TV for four weeks, you're not going to hear anything about this. And so it's very relevant. But, you know, so, so instantly I'd like to say this, Well you know what, we have a donation spot. If you want to donate for the salary of someone, we'll make sure it gets on that night. I can easily shut people down, but I'm not supposed to do that. I'm not supposed to. Or I could say, you know, if you really want to, why don't you just come down and we'll sh and just work with us for a week and we'll let you do it and see how fast you can do it. You know, but people can say anything, especially on social media. On social media, people just, you get somebody in front of you, they're not going to say it. Social media, everybody has an opinion. And that's fine, that's okay. But we've learned from social media not to answer anything like that. We don't answer. No, we do. It's called scrub. We take them off. <laughs> we don't let them comment anymore. They have an opportunity to comment and they have an opportunity to give opinions and especially if it's different. I'm okay with that. But name calling, using vulgarity, you're not going to get anywhere. If you, wanna, if you want to get on so you can hit all of our hundreds of thousands of people that listen, you're going to get to these guys and they're going to get you right off. So the, my point is our words can do a lot of damage. I don't know these people, but if I, had a, if I had a real sensitive nature, it could damage me. It's not damaging me. Think about the words that are being hurled at President Trump. Just think about the death words that are given. I'm not talking about murder. I'm talking about words that could actually hurt his spirit. Think about it. I'm telling you, God has put him there. That guy has the skin of a rhinoceros. I mean, there is, he is continuing to do things in the midst of all those words. This is what Solomon's saying. Imagine if the media today changed and they built him up. Imagine what that would do for him. I mean, you know the words affect him even though he has a skin that's that way. Imagine, the, the, imagine the, the incentive that gives if you know someone's behind you. So Solomon's absolutely right. Your words can do a lot of damage. And sometimes we do it just because we want to say our opinion. Listen, opinions are like noses. Everybody has one. You don't need to always say it. So, amen? Good perfume rejoice the heart is, is just nanoseconds. Kind words do the same thing. That's what Solomon's saying. So in Proverbs 16.24, Solomon equates pleasant words to a honeycomb. He says this. It's the same theme. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb. Sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. So I wanted to do a little bit of study on it. These are not just words, if we think about it. These are something that he says is going to actually do something for people. Uh, if we dive deeper into this verse, we'll find a treasure tr trove of truth about the, of all things, honey. Now, I have some beekeepers in my family. My son's a beekeeper. Wilder has, is a beekeeper. He has his own bee suit, and uh, they have their hives. I'm a beekeeper. I used to be until my bees acted like birds and flew away. But um, there's a lot of people who keep bees. And I want to tell you a little bit about honey, because Solomon's going to mention it several times. So much so that the main part of my message tonight will center on the amazing facts and advantages of what honey can do for a person. So um, this is a honeycomb. People eat that also, believe it or not. In our industrial and synthetic society, many do not know the sweetness or the health properties of a honeycomb. Um, when did you last eat some? 
How many of you had, honey, had some honey today? Okay, so just listen. But to the informed, God's honeybees pollinate plants and they also produce a sweet delight with fascinating results. Let me give you some biblical truths about honey. Of course, God created for our benefit. My son, eat thou honey because it is good and the honeycomb, which is sweet to the taste. Proverbs 24, 13. Cana was flowing with it. Promised land. And I'm come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good land and a large, into a land flowing with milk and honey. Now there were other things that were in that land, lots of fruits and vegetables, but he says milk and honey. Unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. I guess the only ites aren't there are the Mennonites. Here you go. Uh, the manna he gave Israel for 40 years tastes like wafers made with honey. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it like wafers made with honey. Uh, if you go on, it says this. A king sent it as gifts. And take with thee ten loaves and cracknels and a cruise of honey. And go to him, he shall tell thee what shall become of the child. And we see this uh, has some type of prophetic properties. Believe it or not, honey helps you prophesy. Jonathan's eyes were enlightened. But Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath. Wherefore he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in a honeycomb, put his hand to his mouth, and his eyes were enlightened. One translation says he started to prophesy. So honey has some prophetic... And I'm going to show you that again, by the way. Uh, it's not the only scripture. John the Baptist lived on it and recognized Messiah. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins and his meat was locusts and wild honey. I, wanna, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but um, Prevagen doesn't work. I don't care how many jellyfish they attack and, and squeeze and try to get it. It's not going to help your brain. The Bible says honey will help your memory. Now, just watch. A young Jesus ate it with butter. Now, most people do not know this. It may have helped give him discernment over good and evil. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign, Isaiah, it's a prophecy. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, we all know that one, and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. We all know that, but we stop right there. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. You've never seen that verse. I promise you, you've never seen that verse. But we stop that verse short. The reason Christ, the Messiah, could see good... Man, how many of you just want to stop right now? We can go home right now. You heard so much right now. The reason Jesus could discern between good and evil is because of butter and honey. And that's God's word, by the way. So it's a, it's a messianic prophecy. I told you, I'm, I'm going to add something to your diet tonight that you are not going to do without. You're going to do it. I promise you. So, let me give you this last one. He ate it again after his resurrection. Jesus did, believe it or not. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. Luke 40, and you didn't see that one either. Luke 24, 42. How many of you learned a little bit tonight? <laughs> this is powerful stuff. So I just want you to see it. Those are eight amazing verses. No one will deny that honey's sweet. It's true. It's, it's, uh, it's twice as sweet as sugar, by the way, although it's not that, as fattening. If recipe, recipes call for sugar, only a half of the amount of honey is needed. So let me give you some more facts about it. Honey has this. There's about four foods it contains. Number one is, is honey. Long therapeutic history of use in many cultures with lemon for sore throat, a head-to-toe cure-all. And it does cure sore throats. Bee pollen collects on the bee's legs. It's described as true as the perfect food. It has 96 nutrients, rich in zinc, calcium, magnesium, iron. It can energize you, give you a sense of well-being, increase your in intellectual capacity, and close any nutritional gaps in your diet. Then there's propolis. And Mark and I... Look at that propolis. It actually holds the hives together. It's like a wax. But it's a food. It's a waxy resin. The bees use for a variety of things. It is rich in vitamin B, minerals, and bioflavonoids. Has no equal as a natural antibiotic. No equal as an antibiotic. You take that on a cut and put it on your cut, it'll heal you better than anything else. Uh, it stimulates the thymus gland to produce white blood cells to fight or eliminate viruses and waste products. This is honey. I mean... People don't understand it. This is royal jelly, the best, you, best part you can get. It's secreted by a few nurse bees in each hive. It's the exclusive food of the queen bee. She only eats that, by the way. If this wonder food causes her to live 40 times as long as the worker bees and produce double her body weight in eggs every day. Though genetically identical to them, contains a very high concentration of uh, pantothenic acid, essential in humans for growth, reproduction, and normal physiological functions and it contains many complex nutrients. How many of you know what I eat every day? Honey, watch. I'll give you a quick fact. 
Honeybees share out, out jobs based on their age. For instance, worker bees that are one to two days old spend their time cleaning cells, starting with the ones they were born in, as well as keeping the brood warm. From three to five days old, they feed older larvae. From six to 11 days old, they feed the younger larvae. From 12 to 17, old, 17 days old, they produce wax, build combs, carry food, and perform undertaker duties. From 18 to 21 days old, they get guard duty, protecting the hive entrance. From 22 days on, they're the, uh, until their death, at around 40 to 45 days, they get to fly from the hive, collecting pollen, nectar, water, pollinating plants, and things of this nature. Let me tell you something. If you study honeybees, you're going to study the hand of God. It is unbelievable. The ones that first started studying honeybees were monks, Catholic monks, and they made m almost all the observations about them way back when. Here's another fun fact for you. When a bee finds something that will be of significance to the hive, like a new home or a food source, it returns to its hive and it dances. Now listen, the little bee's waggle dance, it's called, is telling the other bees exactly where the food source is, from the direction and distance it is in relation to the hive, right down to the angle it is, it is in relation to the sun. Now watch. Even when the bees dance for hours, he changes the direction and the amount of wiggles he does per cycle in relation to the sun's movements. So he's still telling the other bees exactly where the item is, even though it's a different time of day. These things are absolutely amazing. Honey is the only food that doesn't rot. A honey pot can remain edible for more than 3,000 years. <laughs> I love honey. Here you go. Honey is the only insect-created food with therapeutic, medicinal, nutritional, and cosmetic values. You ladies, listen, you're gonna stop buying all those things for your face. Listen, you ready for it? The benefits of honey. Blood sugar regulation, it's a probiotic. Beautiful and healthy skin, if you put it on your skin, by the way. It soothes coughs, it boosts your memory, it provides nutrients, it's antibacterial, it treats wounds, it heals burns, and reduces ulcers. That's the benefits of honey. Now I want to just give you a couple things here for a second, in a second. A bee flies to a thousands of flowers only to make a spoon of honey, by the way. And this one's kind of interesting. The average worker honey bee makes one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey in her lifetime. In a lifetime. So let me just get you down here for a second here. And now the science behind the biblical statements. So I gave, I, I went to the honey as uh, medicine. This is from a science journal, and I want to read you a couple things from it if I can. Can I? Historically, honey has been used as a folk remedy in cultures around the world for millennia. It has been prescribed informally as a cure for smallpox, baldness, I need to put it on my head, eye diseases, and in, of course I'll stick to everything, that's eye disease and indigestion. It's even been used as a contraceptive. As with most natural cures, unsupported by scientific studies, I sort of chuckle and sigh when I read about things like this. Honey may be a silly substitute for real medicine, but at least it's not bloodletting. However, in this case, the bees may have the last laugh. It turns out that honey's properties make it surprisingly effective cure-all or let's say cure almost everything. Be fruitful and multiply. Honey's salutary effects stem primarily from its antimicrobial properties. Most bacteria and other microorganisms cannot grow or reproduce in honey. Microorganisms can't grow in it. I found it quite surprising because all things being equal, bacteria love sugar. Honey contains around 40% fructose and 30% glucose, among other sugars, making it seemingly a great treat for microbes. However, honey is also somewhat acidic and acids prevent the growth of, of bacteria. More importantly, honey does not provide the water and oxygen needed to support bacterial growth. Although honey contains a fair amount of water, it's super saturated with sugar, meaning the water is not available to the microorganisms. So what happens when you dilute honey with water? The bacteria just multiply like crazy, right? Well, no. Amazingly, diluted honey supports the growth of bacteria that are helpful to humans while killing off dangerous strains. Also, certain types of beneficial bacteria that live in the human intestines and aid digestion do well in a mixture of honey and water. But honey also contains a substance called glucose, glucose oxidase. When combined with water and oxygen, glucose oxidase forms gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide, the very same stuff you probably have in your medicine cabinet right now, hydrogen peroxide, you put it on your wounds. This means that diluted honey can serve as an excellent antiseptic while being far less likely than ordinary hydrogen peroxide to harm already damaged tissue. Hydrogen peroxide will harm your tissue. Honey won't. Show me the honey. What does all this mean in practical terms? For one thing, it means that honey applied topically to a wound can promote healing just as well as, or in many cases better than, conventional ointments and dressings. Its antibacterial properties prevent infection. It also functions as an anti-inflammatory agent, reducing both swelling and pain. As if that weren't enough, it even reduces scarring. In studies around the world, honey has been shown to be extraordinarily effective 
in treatment of wounds, burns, and surgical incisions. Honey also functions as a moisturizer, ladies, making it useful treatment for sunburn as well as general purpose skin softener. But wait, there's more. Honey is a true head-to-toe cure. Honey has been shown to be effective in treating inflammation of the eyelids, some type of con conjunctivitis and keratitis, along with other forms of corneal damage. It can also, believe it or not, be used to treat athlete's foot and other fungal infections. A spoonful of sugar is the medicine. Lest you think the honey is only healthy if you use it on the outside of your body, it can also help a great many internal problems too. Thanks to its antimicrobial action, it not only soothes sore throats, but can also kill the bacteria that sometimes causes them. I heard a doctor tell me there's nothing that will cure sore throat. There is. Honey will. Uh, research tells us, uh, suggests it could actually reduce tooth decay, all that sticky sugar notwithstanding. Moving down the esophagus and through the digestive tract, honey can help to heal ulcers and upset stomachs. It also has been proven to regulate intestinal function, alleviating both constipation and diarrhea. In a similar surgical way, honey can be used both as a sleep aid and to increase alertness. Honey also contains a variety of antioxidants, which may reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and some cancers. Um, uh, mankua honey, made from the flowers of the mankua bush, comes from New Zealand, uh, UMF it's called. Uh, intriguingly, honey with UMF is even effective against many so-called superbugs, strains of bacteria such as Streptococcus effect uh, aureus that are resistant to multiple types of antibiotics. Um, it says this, never feed honey to a child under one year of age. Honey sometimes contains Clostridium botulism. Although they're inactive in honey itself, once in, inside a digestive tract, they can multiply and cause a potential fatal disease of the nervous system called infant botulism. But by the time of the child's first birthday, there's enough beneficial bacteria in his digestive tract or hers to make it an a, a inhospitable environment for the botulism, meaning that honey can be eaten safely the rest of their lives. It says, I don't think I've ever seen a sick bee. Coincidence? Probably not. But honey makes may, maybe one miracle cure that lives up to the buzz. Yes? Yep. Sure. They do have it. It is. Yes. Yes. That's exactly right. Yeah. And he's right. You know, I have people, Mark, Mark produces some honey and he sells it out all the time because, you, and he's absolutely right, you have to have local honey because you have the local things that are against you and they're eating off of those. So it's almost like a homeotherapy. Uh, so that's local honey's the best. So, yes. Well, I think a spoonful, from what I've looked at, is a spoonful a day. Sometimes anywhere from a half of a spoon to a spoonful a day is what they say. And, and you can mix that with water, too. Now, why does Solomon tell us that? Why does Solomon, here's where we're going. <laughs> Solomon's talking about your words being like honey. Now, how many are getting, don't miss this. Don't miss it. How many understand what we're talking about? He's saying your words do the exact same thing that honey does. Don't miss the parallel here. It's very, very important. He says, pleasant words are as honeycomb, sweet to the soul, and health to the bones. So he's giving you benefits. I gave you the benefits of honey, physically and, and mentally. Solomon's saying your words can do the exact same thing. It's pretty powerful when he's saying this. So now all of us will want to go out and, as I said, add to your grocery list some honey. I thought I'd give you a little bit of a treat tonight, though, so I brought you some. Here's your daily dose. Would you pass one out and just... Sweet, I get it. <laughs> no pun intended. So I want you to have some honey. You're welcome. You're welcome. Then I'm going to go to the spiritual lesson and continue on. <laughs> Mark supplies them. Mark supplies them. Where is that? Alabama gives them best avi, isn't it? We don't supply these. Not those. He's talking about, about where you sold your honey to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. So. Yeah. The beehives. I think he has four of them. I had two of them. But you got to help wear a suit. Yeah. All right. Let me go on with a little bit. Everybody, don't let me lose you. Everyone. Let's go on a little bit, all right? So, here's a spiritual lesson. First, it's amazing how 3,000 years uh, after Solomon's advice on the benefits of honey, modern science has proven it, is it not? Does that not prove the Bible to you? Everybody say yes. Thank you. All right, secondly, so what's the application? Well, for us tonight, 
You just heard what a daily dose of honey can do for your body, inside and out. So honey is precious. It's sweet to our taste. Enlivens our, it enlivens our eyes. It energizes our bones and many nat nutritional properties and overall health. But Solomon says, now watch it, that pleasant words, just kind words, can do the exact same thing. He's saying your kind words can give health to people. That's not something we usually associate either. We never looked, we, you were surprised at some of the properties of honey, but Solomon's saying there's a surprise in just being kind to people, be having kind words. Our words should be the same. They should cause others to rejoice and be glad they heard us speak, and they should build others up in a profitable way. Ephesians tells us that. It says, do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what's helpful for building up other, others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen, just like honey. He's making that parallel. Our Lord could, could uh, slice and confound the Pharisees when he wanted to and when he needed, but his disciples knew him for his gracious and helpful speech. Uh, so all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. It's Jesus. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? He was making, he was building them up. So he was doing something for their, for their souls. Unnecessary harshness in speech is not a sign of manliness or the spirit of God. It's actually a sign of the enemy. And so we're, call, we're called to just build each other up. And who could deny that God's words are sweet? Are they not sweeter than honey? That's what the Bible says. It says, the law of the Lord, the testimonies, words, the statutes, the commandments of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Psalm 19. So let me leave you with one last one, talking about eating, even though there's strawberries here. Uh, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blesses the man that trusts him. So there's always that parallel of tasting something, and, and especially to honey. So now, how has your conversation been this week to the ones you love? Would they say it was like honey to them? Matter of fact, uh, to the one you call sweetheart. And you know, sometimes you actually call them honey. Hello? Do you not call the people you love honey? Hey, honey, why do you think you do that? How about to others? Were you uplifting? Were you sweet to be around? Were you full of life? So tonight I came to speak life to your bones, not death. I came to tell you that we can change our speech. To uplift, to not tear down, to encourage, and to give you just a taste of what you are to give to others. So the second part of Proverbs, and I'm going quickly, uh, gives us warnings about the opposite use of words and actions. They are kind of juxtaposed on each other. Troublemakers start fights. Gossips break up friendships. Again, words. Callous climbers betray their, betray their own friends. That, you do that with a word. Uh, they stab their own grandmothers in the back. That's pretty tough. A shifty eye betrays an evil intention. A clenched jaw signals trouble ahead. Gray hair is a mark of distinction. The award for a God-loyal life. Moderation is better than muscle. Self-control better than political power. Make your motives and cast your votes, but God has the final say. So, it goes on, the first one is this. A perverse person stirs up conflict and a gossip separates close friends. How many of you know that's true? So, when we see this in verse 28, whisper, there's a couple synonyms for gossiper in scripture. A whisperer, a uh, throwword, all those synonyms actually mean to scatter seed. I remember, you remember this, uh, how many remember the message I gave at Cathedral about the pillow and gossip? Um, I took a pillow out and talked about gossip and I took a pillow and uh, the curator of the church was a little bit upset with me but I took the pillow and I had a fan behind me, a feather pillow and the church was crowded with people and I, took the, I talked about gossip and I ripped the pillow open and I said this is what gossip does and I took that feathers and I just shook them and it went straight, they went everywhere, these little feathers, they're all over the place and I said when you gossip it's like, it's like taking that pillow and opening those feathers and letting them go, it's very, it's almost impossible to get them back. Once your words are spoken, they're gone. And uh, I told people, I said, get ready. You're going to see these feathers all around town. Where did you see one, Chad? In the Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix, Arizona. I in my Bible and I flew to Arizona. The, there were people that were finding those feathers around Birmingham for like four months, five months. They, were, they would bring one because we had some of them that they were a specific type of, of feather. And so that's what gossip is. It just keeps going and going. And let me tell you something. How many of you have ever heard people say, well, they say. So, they have you heard of the terrible family they and the dreadful venomous things they say? Why well, half the gossip under the sun, if you trace it back, you will find begun in that wretched house of they. They say this and they say that. Winston Churchill hated gossip and this is an interesting story about him. Winston Churchill exemplified integrity and respect in the face of opposition. During his last year in office, he attended the offic an official ceremony. Several rows behind him, two gentlemen began whispering. That's Winston Churchill. They say he's getting senile. They say he should step aside and leave the running of the nation to more dynamic and capable men. When the ceremony was over, Churchill turned to the men and said, Gentlemen, they also say he's deaf. <laughs> I love that one. So, 
let me give you a little take, my take on it. If someone says, I hope you don't mind me telling you this, it's pretty certain you will. One of the best ways to end a rumor is to ask if you may quote the individual passing it along. If the person says no, it's possible that the rumor is just idle talk. If the person answers yes, you should contact the gossip's subject to verify the story you heard. Also, if you like to spread news about others, ask yourself if you would want someone to quote you. A negative answer is a good sign you should keep your lips sealed on the matter. And a positive response should lead not to back fence reporting, but upfront conf com uh, confronting. So some interesting things just to let you see it. Let me get you in another way. Proverbs 28, 6, 16, 28. Don't believe every word. A whisperer, in other words, is also referred to as a gossip. They have nothing worthwhile to do with their time. Their slothfulness deprives them of the things they need. And as such, they become envious of those who through diligent work have made some, something of themselves. They make it their business to, uh, to uh, meddle in other people's matters. And uh, through <coughs> the sour taste of the fruit of their lips, they cause discord in relationships. So obviously you don't want to do that. That's what Solomon's telling you. Um, Proverbs 16.29, he goes on and he says this. A violent man entices his neighbor and leads him to the way that is not good. We have to get careful who we influence and most importantly how we influence them. Before I was saved, I told you this many times, I ran drugs from Penn State to my home two and a half hours away in Pennsylvania. I'll tell you, it bothered me an awful lot when I thought about how many kids, how many people depended on me for those drugs and how many, how many youth like I was uh, that I had actually gotten to do that. It still bothers me when I think about it. I thank God that my influence today is for Jesus to push him and not drugs because, listen, I was effective in pushing it. I'm just as effective as I am pushing Jesus, but I'd rather push Jesus than anything else. Amen? God does not look favorably on those who push evil. Those who lead others in a way that is not good. So if you see others leading your kids or your grandkids in the way of evil, let me tell you what you need to do. Get involved. I would never let my kids get influenced by somebody who was evil. If I knew it was happening, I sat those other kids down and told them you'll never see my child again. Uh, you get, get involved. You need to stop it right in the beginning because people, kids are very, very influenced, and even in your grandkids. So I'm giving you my wisdom as well as anything else tonight. Here's this one, Proverbs 16.30. Watch out for people who grin and wink at you. They have thought of something evil. I can actually say it that way. They have thought of something evil. Do you ever have people who grin and wink at you and you know, just don't trust them? You know, there's a word that we have out for it. It's called this. Anybody heard that word? Schmoozers. Know what a schmoozer is? How many of you know what a schmoozer is? How many of you do not know what a schmoozer is? All right, here's your definition. Somebody who manipulates through clever conversation or flattery so as to further themselves, a sweet talker, generally related to sales pitches, chasing ladies. I can't believe some of the stuff he's saying, he is such a schmoozer. And so we have people like that all over the place. Um, there's, I remember a pastor on staff with me and uh, we just hired him and uh, I liked him but I had some reservations and he said to me, uh, he was, uh, somebody said to him, oh, you're so sweet. And he, and, uh, he came to me and he says, oh, I'm just a schmoozer. I took him aside and said, don't be. Because the Bible says not to be. You don't want to tell people things just to make them feel good about themselves. And you're false. I told you about lifting people up. Solomon said lifting people. That's a genuine thing. But you don't want to do it to manipulate people. You don't want to compliment people to manipulate. The word flattery in scripture is always, is always in a negative connotation. Because basically you could flatter somebody. You could give somebody a compliment. That's different than flattery. Flattery is building them up because you don't have an alternative motive. A compliment is something different. And that's what he's telling us. All right, let's get on to the, to the meat of, the, of this study. Gray hair is a crown of beauty when it's found in the way of righteousness. Signs of aging can be evidence of uh, maturity, dignity, and inner beauty. So I decided to find out what benefits there are to aging. If you're 70 or older, these are the benefits. Kidnappers are not very interested in you. <laughs> you know, hostage situation, you're likely to be released first. <laughs> People call at 9 p.m. and ask, did I wake you? People no longer view you as a hypochondriac. There's nothing left to learn the hard way. Things you buy now won't wear out. You enjoy hearing about other people's operations. You have a party at the neighbors and the neighbors don't even realize it. You no longer think of speed limits as a challenge. You quit trying to hold your stomach in no matter who walks into the room. You sing along with the elevator music. Your investment in health insurance is finally beginning to pay off. Your joints are more accurate meteorologists than the National Weather Service. Your secrets are safe with your friends because they can't remember them. Your supply of brain cells is finally down to a manageable size. And you can't remember who sent this. That's the funny thing, but there's an actual truth in getting old. Here's the, here's the upside of getting old. 
uh, percentage of ages 65 plus saying that they're experiencing each of the following more often as they get older. Spending time with your family. 66% say they are spending more time. Germany 70, Italy 79. The whole idea of life is, fam is family. It's the most important thing in your life. Other than God, the most important thing in your life is family. It's not your career. It's not, it's not working. It's, not, it's your family. Your family, your husband, your wife, your kids, your grandkids, your relatives. That family is the most important thing. And boy, you have to get old to understand that. Because when you're young, you just sail right by it. Spending time on hobbies. I think if you get older, you should have a bunch of hobbies, as many as you possibly can. Uh, having less stress in life. That Stress is a killer. Uh, you should be able to, to eliminate lots of diseases just by retiring and being older because you eliminate your stress. And doing volunteer work. Very, very productive when you're older because you get great benefits from it. You realize you're helping someone else and you have time to do it. And traveling for pleasure, 38%. Of course, in Wayne's case, that's 190%. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me go on. Let me get close to closing time. This says, 1632 says, Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. It's pretty powerful. It's the might of the slow to anger, folks. It's all over Scripture, both the Old and New Testament. Why? Well, someone who is slow to anger is not impulsive. They're not rude. They're not arrogant. And they can influence people more than an army that can take an entire city. It's all... It's all about that discipline. The Bible talks about it all over the place. James, this you know, my brother, beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife. The slow to anger calms the dispute, Proverbs 15. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Uh, and he who rules the spirit, then he who captures the city. Our text tonight. Proverbs 19.11, you'll see it again. A man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it's his glory to overlook a transgression. And Titus 1.7, New Testament. For the overseer, somebody over a, over a church body, must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain. So not quick-tempered is slow to anger. So it's all over Scripture. Lastly, Proverbs 16.33. The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. That's an interesting Scripture verse. Let me give it to you. It's something where you can understand it. We may throw the dice is what it says, but the Lord determines how they fall. Man, that will mess up. That will mess up... Uh, Las Vegas, will it not? It's talking about God's sovereignty and, it's God, and, God, and God being in control. What's it saying? Here it is. In God's vocabulary, and I'll close with this in a second, there is no such thing as coincidence. In God's vocabulary, there's no such thing as chance. In God's vocabulary, there's no such thing as luck. In God's vocabulary, there's no such thing as an accident. In God's vocabulary, it's just providence. Providence. God is sovereign. God is good. Providence. The doctrine of providence. God is the divine creator of the universe and he has the power to control his creation. God continues to oversee and sustain his universe today. He now upholds all things by the word of his power. We don't hear about his providence anymore. Providence is God knowing. He has pre-knowledge of everything. Uh, people talk about predestination, predetermining. God knows. He knows everything. doesn't mean he fixes everything, but he knows everything. Providence is an interesting doctrine. When the pilgrims came, one of the first cities they made was Providence, Rhode Island. It meant that God knew that's where they were supposed to be. Uh, if you look in, in uh, almost every state in the United States has a Providence, one or two of them. Alabama has a Providence, Alabama. It's in Walker County. It has 230 people in it. And so let me just tell you that Providence is, a, is an amazing thing of God. It is... It says no matter what happens. So basically it's talking about him having everything in his hand. That doesn't mean he's controlling everything, but it means he can if he wants to control something, he can. He is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to do. So here's what St. Augustine said. He said, trust the past to God's mercy, the present to God's love, and the future to God's providence. The steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. He knows where you're going to be tomorrow. He's already there waiting for you. The God of the vanishing point. So he knows that. So that gives you a solace to know that God's in control. How many believe God's in control? So tonight as I close, it's an important theological promise that the word of God and why Solomon wants us to remember. We quote it regularly and we need to let it sink way deep into our spirits. We quote this all the time, but we really need to think on it. God declares, Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you. What, how many of you have plans? God has plans. How many of you know that your plans don't all automatically line up to God's plans? Not necessarily. I know the plans there for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and to give you a future. That's a promise from God. Several promises in one. We need to let it sink in. So what does it tell me? God's in control. 
This is when I was lying in a hospital bed and I was, they were telling me I had, I may not make it through the night because of my stage four cancer and it was all over my body. And they were taking blood out of me every three hours and I was laying there and Cheryl was crying in the cot next to me while asking God, God, I know that, I know this is not for his death. And I saw her sobbing and the doctors coming in and out with that look on their face like he's going to be dead by the morning. And when I looked at my body and realized that my body felt like it was going to be dead by the morning, I could only think of one thing. God was in control. And I, I, I surrendered to it. God, you're in control. I, I want you to take it over. Um, I don't tell this to a whole lot of people and I want to be super spiritual on people, but I had... The only time I've ever had them, I had six powerful visions when I was in there. And I was awake, I was, I was explaining them to Cheryl as I had them. And uh, I, saw, I saw so many things that really kind of showed me what was going on there. And it let me realize that God was in control. And I haven't said those visions in a long, long time. I remember saying when I first came out, I remember preaching about them. But those visions were so powerful. And I was wide awake. Cheryl was, I was talking to Cheryl and telling her the vision as it was happening. Seven, pow six powerful visions. I've shared about five of them. The sixth one I haven't been able to share yet because I've just not been released to do it. But everybody wants to know about their future, do they not? How many want to know about your future? Let me tell you how much people want to know about their future. Who knows what's in your tomorrow? God, people. God knows. Why do people do people want to know their future? Well, I'll show you they do. Here's your psychic service statistics. There's over 80,000 psychics working in the United States. 80,000. It's two billion dollar a year industry. Two billion dollars. People are calling up. They want to know what the psychics know. In total, clients are spending over two billion dollars a year on psychic service, services. The psychic industry is recession proof. You can have a recession, it'll always go up. The psychic industry has never had a slip. If somebody was an investor and they were secular, they want to invest in psychic hotline because it's never had a slip with any depression, a monetary depression. That's it. It's growing at a rate of two percent each and every year. So what are people calling up psychics to know? You're going to be surprised. You ready for it? So 54% call psychics up because they want general future questions. How, when, where, how, and, you know, why? Is he dark haired? Does he have teeth? You know, the whole thing. 14% is healing questions. Obviously people who are sick. People calling up, will I be, will I be whole? Will I be, will I be well? You know, when I was having cancer, I would, I would talk to the Lord, obviously, as I, as I, as I, um, as I pray. And for me, not for you, for anybody else, for me, God has a way of showing me something that's going to happen. He has a way of telling me something in my spirit. Uh, he does a certain thing for me, and, that, and I could tell whether it's yes or no. And I'd, I'd ask him, am I going to live? And he would always tell me yes, always. And I'm not talking an audible voice. I'm talking about something that happens in my body uh, that, that I know that God's speaking to me. And uh, I've, I've done that recently, and he says yes. And so people want to know, am I going to live? What's, gonna, what's this disease going to do for me? What's going to happen? They're calling psychics up. You ready for this one? 13% want to contact dead friends and relatives. That's necromancy. It's forbidden in Leviticus. And 19%, Andy, Dr. Andy, want to know the future of their pets. <laughs> You're in the wrong business. <laughs> you should sign a little sign next to it. Also, futures for pets. No. That's what they want to know. Because people are enamored to their pets and they want to know, I guess, if their pets are going to heaven or what's going to happen, how long they're going to live. People want to know the future. You do too. You want to know the future, so do I. Solomon ends Proverbs 16 by saying this. My unknown future is in the hands of an all-knowing God. I trust them. You, many of you have been through it. There is nothing that should come your way that you don't trust God on and don't realize that He has a future for you. No matter, even if the enemy intends it for evil, Genesis chapter 50, God will use it for your good. Somebody say amen to that. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? Father, I thank you tonight for your word. Man, how much you give us in your word. From what we can eat, Lord God, to how we speak, Lord Jesus, to how to trust you in the future. I'm thankful for the book of Proverbs, Lord God. I'm thankful that it's inspired by your spirit. I'm thankful that Solomon knew it and wrote it down. And I'm thankful that we can read it thousands of years later, 3,000 years later, and can still apply to us. I challenge any book to do that. Any saying, let alone all of the sayings. I pray a blessing on everyone of us here tonight, Lord God. Bless us all. In Jesus' name, amen. And one last thing I want to tell you, you can give God a hand for that. One last thing I want to tell you, eat your honey.